It's always nice to start the morning out being compared to Christian Bale, but uh, <laughs> good morning, Kern County. It is uh, amazing to be back with you uh, and, and be back with Richard and his crew. Uh, it's been a couple years. Uh, obviously, there's a rich day of material ahead of you. I was looking through the schedule. you got a lot to talk about. I'm here, of course, to start out by giving you kind of the 30,000-foot view of what's happening out there in the global economy, the national economy, and, of course, focusing right down here at California and into Kern County itself. Um, what's the big picture? Uh, you know, 2018 was a pretty good year. You look back at the numbers, whether you're talking about consumer spending or GDP or exports, a lot of good things happened last year. But of course, as good as 2018 was, it kind of ended on a sour note. Um, first of all, of course, we had that little bit of a seismic shift in the election. Uh, and boy, I mean, it's amazing, right? Midterms are supposed to be the boring election. This one sucked all the oxygen out of the room. There was nothing going on in the entire world except for that election for a few weeks there. Pretty intense, and obviously uh, some big changes from a political standpoint looking ahead. But it wasn't just that. Then we had, of course, the market tantrum. We had a major sell-off in the stock market, and with the sell-off in the stock market came all these negative headlines. The US economy is strong. Three signs it won't last. Storm clouds on the horizon may enter recession in 2020. P pretty grim tridings, to say the very least. And, of course, let's not forget real estate. If you haven't been listening, uh, of course, there's been a big slowdown in the national real estate market, which, again, a lot of folks look to as a leading indicator for what might be happening to the U.S. economy over the next couple years. Now, this is interesting, because Richard did point out that back in 2006, I was a pessimist. In 2006, I was a guy running around talking about, if you will, uh, how, how to balance things were. And, and it's interesting, because in 2006 and 2007, my, my colloquial nickname here in the state of California was Dr. Doom. Somewhere in the middle of 2008, that shifted over to Dr. Oh, damn, he's right. <laughs> but putting all that to one side, you know, here we have kind of a similar negative feeling about where the economy is going. And what I did is I actually went back in time to kind of pull out what I was talking about back in that period. And it's interesting, particularly when it comes to the stock market decline, for example, and all the negative headlines that are wrapped around that. It's interesting because as you may have heard, or at least been heard, told on numerous occasions, the stock market knows all, it sees all, it is, if you will, a very important leading indicator. Which is humorous because if you think back to the Great Recession, things got really ugly around the time of, of course, the failure of Lehman Brothers. That's when the stock market tanked in a big way. But what's interesting is that was August 2008. Technically speaking, the recession began in December of 2007. Stock market didn't foretell the Great Recession. Quite the opposite. They were in utter denial about what was happening in the economy until the actual failure of Lehman Brothers. They weren't the first domino in the chain. It was the last domino in the chain, if you will. What caused the Great Recession? Well, it had to do with all the excesses in the economy in the buildup to the Great Recession. In 2006, as good as things felt, Scratch away, get into the heart of the matter, and here's what you saw, an economy that was completely out of control. We were vastly overborrowing. Home, we were vastly overbuilding homes. And of course, last and not least, probably most of all, was we were vastly overspending. There was a dramatic decline in savings rates as consumers got way ahead of themselves. If you cared to look clearly we had maybe a solid economy at the surface, but the foundations it was sitting on were rotten to the core, and that all started to come apart in, of course, December of 2007. The failure of Lehman Brothers and the collapse in the stock market are when the economy went basically went from denial of what was going on to utter and complete hysteria about what was going on. And you know what? We're still in the midst of that hysteria 10 years later. Every time I turn around, I see another headline like this. American middle class hasn't gotten raised in 15 years. Millennial will be the first generation poorer than their parents. We're measuring the economy all wrong. Things are just as bad as it was in the Great Recession. It's amazing to me. There seems to be this incessant need to constantly tell everybody just how bad things are. 
Now, I have a word for this. If I had to sum up all these headlines in one word, it's a word I just love. I found it a couple of years ago, and it so perfectly captures the national spirit. It's miserableism. <laughs> now, miserableism is a real word. It is the philosophy of pessimism, or as I like to put it, desperately trying to convince people things are worse than they actually are. Some of my favorite, favorite miserableists, the 24 Hours News Networks. If you had all four 24-hour news networks up on, a, on the side somewhere, invariably one will have crisis in giant red letters screaming across the screen, right? And of course, then there's the stock market. Wall Street loves bad news because bad news drives volatility, which drives trading, which drives commissions, which drives profits. Bad news is good news on Wall Street. And then, of course, let's not forget the state of political America. Politicians here have really shifted towards, hey, how can we create a vision of a wonderful future to how bad can I make the economy sound right now and, of course, blame the guy on the other side of the aisle? Politics has devolved into miserableism 101, and, of course, not the least of which is the president, who, of course, ran on a campaign of making America great again, as if somehow or other we're not. Now, for me, again, I can't really understand <clears throat> this miserable list, either in the short run or the long run. It isn't to say we don't have challenge, but take a step back and think where our economy is right now. Last year was a great year, 3% growth. About a half percent of that, by the way, came from the fiscal stimulus boost that we got from the tax plan at the end of 2017. Therein by itself goes to the heart of miserableism. We are in a late expansion, full employment economy, and Congress passed fiscal stimulus. They cut taxes and increased federal spending on the basis of a massive increase in the deficit. That is a policy you use in recessions. You don't use fiscal stimulus in a late expansion full employment economy. But that's what we did. It's to the core of how out of whack our conversations are relative to the reality of the world. Look at the underpinnings. Look at the fundamentals. Unlike 2006, this economy looks great. Labor markets, consumer spending, business investment, home production, wages, exports, energy, debt levels, everything is on safe, sustainable, steady paths. Yes, are we going to slow down this year? Of course we are. We're going to go back to probably maybe 2.2 to 2.5% because fiscal stimulus is over. It's a one-time hit. The sugar rush wears off. There's no surprise there. That's just how it works. As for a chance of recession the next 24 months, including, of course, next year, that big 2020, I don't see it. I don't see it. And you know, it's interesting because every time, that seems a little out of whack, if you will, relative to some of the broader conversations. In fact, in last year, if you've read any of these negative articles, they always go back to the Wall Street Journal next recession poll. I just love this poll. It comes out every year. They poll 160 economists. And this year, this year, 60% agreed the next recession is in 2020. Now, I would argue that if you actually answer this survey, you have proven you are not qualified to answer this survey. <laughs> because the idea that you would ask somebody when the next recession is going to occur, that question is nonsensical. It's not when, it's why. Why is the next recession going to occur? What's the shock to the system? What's the imbalance? What's the problem? What is going to cause the kind of massive chaos in our markets, labor markets, that we call recession. If you don't have a why, there is no when. If you don't have a why, the only appropriate answer to when is the next recession going to be is, oh, I have no idea. And unfortunately, that's not an entry in that particular survey. <laughs> now, it's worth noting as well that, of course, this is a 2018 survey. There was a 2017 survey from the Wall Street Journal. <clears throat> that said the next recession was going to be in 2019. The year before that, it was going to be in 2018. Working with me here? According to the Wall Street Journal, the next recession is always two years away. Hmm. That's good news when you think about it. Now again, is everything wonderful? Of course not. We have labor shortages, housing shortages, market volatility, rising long-run rates, an overly aggressive Fed, sharp growth in government deficits, global trade and security worries. I get that. These are stressors on the economy. There are things we have to pay attention to, but none of these things rise to the level of being recession-causing. Not yet. Maybe they will. 
Maybe things will change. Maybe they'll become worse, and we have to start worrying about that. That's the beauty of my job. You've got to invite me back every year to find out. <laughs> but right now, none of these things worry me that much. What does worry me more than anything else is political dysfunction. The fact that we live in a world where politicians on both sides of the aisle, candidly, are running around with their hair on fire talking about how the economic sky is falling in in the context of one of the healthiest economies I've ever seen. And that, to me, is a truly scary, because while they're running around with their hair on fire trying to fix problems that don't exist right now, what they are really doing is ignoring the long-run problems that do need to be handled, whether it's underinvestment in infrastructure, rising wealth inequality, health care cost inflation, pension and entitlement reform, important things that we have to deal with before these become a true crisis. But as opposed to dealing with that, much easier to run around pretending there's problems that don't actually exist. Not a good way to run a state and something that's going to catch up to us. Now, I got a lot of data in here, and I've already talked too long. So I'm going to buzz through a whole bunch of statistics, and hopefully near the end we'll have a little time for Q&A, but we'll see. Let's just get right into it. Again, last year was a good year. We had about 2.5% growth in the fourth quarter, overall a 3% growth year. Every part of the economy looked good last year. Exports looked good. Consumer spending looked good. Business investment looked good. Government spending looked good. Everything looked good. Only one tiny negative, and that was residential real estate. That did slow down just a little bit, but everything else looked good. I always start with consumers. Consumers are two-thirds of the economy. If the consumer is healthy, they can power the U.S. through a lot of turbulence. How's the consumer looking? Great. Overall spending drifted up at the end of last year, about 3% overall real growth on a year-on-year basis, solid numbers. More important, savings rate is... I don't know what's going on here. I'm having a little bit of problem. Should I, should I move over to this thing? Am I fading out on you? No, am I good? Okay, never mind. So the savings rate was run, is still running between 6 and 7%. That's a healthy number. It's not only way better than it was in 2005, it's better than it was in 2000. So the American public is spending more, and they're spending on the basis of money they are earning, not borrowing. In fact, from a financial standpoint, American households haven't looked as healthy in a very long time. Ever since the giant deleveraging at the back end of the Great Recession ended, incomes have been growing faster than debt accumulation. As a result of that, debt-to-income ratios have been falling. And indeed, on the right-hand side, because of low interest rates, the financial obligation ratio, the percent of household income spent on financial obligations, is the lowest it has ever been. Credit markets look incredibly clean. Home sales have slowed down a little bit over the course of the year. There's no doubt about it. I mentioned that. About 12% nationally, a little more than that here in the state of California. But you know, let's be a little careful here. Look at those numbers. You see a bit of a slowdown. But I tell you, it doesn't really look like what happened back in 2006. Now, mind you, a slowdown won't typically precede a big sell-off. But nevertheless, that's a big claim to make. But of course, that's what everybody is immediately jumping to in terms of a conclusion. Housing markets showing signs of cracking. These are the kind of headlines you hear. Is there any reality to this? And the answer is no. Again, just take a look at the trends right off the bat. Back then, there was a collapse in sales. And by the way, because of the collapse in sales, a lot of people started listing their homes because they were desperate to unload their over-leveraged property. This time around, there's been a slowdown in sales. And guess what? People aren't bothering to list their properties at all. Inventories are still really tight. This doesn't look anything like what happened back then. And if you truly think there's going to be a market sell-off, where is the problem in the housing market? Last time, we vastly overbuilt. We were vastly overborrowing. Are any of those things in the system now? The answer is no. Look, I already talked about household debt, which is actually growing slower than incomes. So overall, we're not seeing a big accumulation of mortgage debt. And indeed, you know, this is interesting. On the left-hand side here, here's the downside of what happened after the Great Recession ended. Dodd-Franks. Dodd-Franks had a number of very negative consequences. There's some good parts to it, but there were a lot of negative parts to it. And one of them was it froze the mortgage markets, and you haven't seen a bounce back in home ownership the way you might have expected. That is a long-run policy failure. The silver lining to this cloud is on the right side. That's the mortgage origination by credit score. The median credit score for a mortgage borrower right now is above 750. Again, that's better than it was in 2000 and 2001. This is one of the cleanest mortgage markets we've ever seen. Why would you expect any kind of problems in a mortgage market like this? As for the pace of construction, 
for the most part, people have been complaining about not building too much, but not building enough. A lot of economists have thought that the housing market has vastly underperformed in this particular expansion. I don't tend to agree with that. Yes, permits of 1.2 million is historically low, but then again, so is the pace of household formation and overall population growth in the United States. 1.2 million to me is just about the Goldilocks zone, not too hot, not too cold. I see no reason to fear anything in this particular housing market. What set off, I think, this little bit of a slowdown? Rising interest rates. And mortgage rates have come up. A couple years ago, they were below 3.5%. For a brief period at the end of last year, they got close to 5%. Sounds a little scary. Seems like a big hike. But you know, I think context is important. You look at that graph in the left, you go, wow, that's a big increase. Now let me show you, let me show you a slightly different way of putting this. And by the way, for, uh, just out of curiosity, who's a Gen Xer in the audience? If you're a Gen Xer, you will appreciate this. Because if you were a Gen Xer, you had to listen to your father tell you at least 300 times a year about the 47% mortgage rate he paid back in 1982. <laughs> now, maybe it wasn't quite that high, but here's mortgage rates over the last 30 years or so. And take a close look at where, where rates are. You see that big increase on the left? That's that tiny, tiny little blip on the right-hand side. Interest rates are really low, folks. Yes, they drifted up a bit, but there's no problem there. Industrial production's doing great. That's up across the board. You know, hot and cold parts of the market overall, but good solid numbers. One big driving force of industrial production is oil, oil production. Shale oil has truly changed the energy markets in ways that we're not really integrating into our sort of economic outlook. The US, 10 years ago, was producing 5,000 barrels a day. We're at 12, million, excuse me, 12 million barrels a day, 1,000 million. I'm an economist, for God's sake, OK? <laughs> it's a few zeros. It's up. That's all you need to know. We're producing 12 million barrels a day. That's an insane amount of oil, vastly more than Saudi Arabia, vastly more than Russia. And we are the swing player. You know, oil prices dropped last year from a little over 70 down to 50, and everybody, again, took this as a negative sign for the economy. Actually not. Quite the opposite. I couldn't figure out why they were going up in the first place. We are washed, awash with oil right now. And unfortunately, that is a problem for, obviously, Kern County. It has been an oil producer, but it has not been enjoying the shale boom. By the way, the price of shale oil is $50 a barrel. So there's no significant reason for those oil prices to be going anytime and anywhere up in the near future. Something to be thinking about. Now we're going to come back. I understand that's been an issue for the county, but there's lots of other good things happening here, and that is starting to play out in the data. Exports have also been doing great. We had a record year for exports last year in real terms. Across the globe, everything was positive. The only place we saw a little bit of a slowdown in exports was to China. Everybody else was positive. Good, solid numbers. But, of course, while his exports were good, imports were better at some level. And one of the interesting things going on in the United States right now is the trade deficit, which has been a big concern, has been widening. Why? Well, again, there's different interpretations of the trade deficit. There's the economist version and kind of all everybody else's in, incorrect interpretation. <laughs> the economist interpretation of the trade deficit is a gap between what we as a nation produce and what we consume. If you consume as a nation more than you produce, you have to get the rest of that consumption from someplace else, the rest of the world in the form of a trade deficit. If you want to know why we run a trade deficit, why are we consuming more than we produce? Well, much of that can go right back to the federal government. The federal government on an annual basis for decades has not balanced its budget. It has consistently spent more than it has actually brought in in terms of revenues, and they are building up a massive federal debt. The problem is, is we as individuals don't take the federal debt into account in terms of our personal decisions. We just don't. We should, but we don't. And so as a result of that, we're not saving to pay off our share of the federal debt, and as a nation, we end up over-consuming. Now, at the end of 2017, we had fiscal stimulus. They cut taxes. They increased spending. The federal government started borrowing a lot more. Of of course, when they did that, it was going to start causing imports to rise and the trade deficit to open. In other words, the trade deficit is widening because of that tax plan that was put into place in 2017. Now, that's not what you heard. What you heard was something a little different. 
which is that we have a trade deficit that's caused by the rest of the world not treating us fairly. We need trade wars because they're easy to win and good for the economy. This scared me, I gotta tell you, this worried me. I did not like where this was going. I mean, you talk about setting off trade wars with the European Union, with NAFTA, with China, this could have gotten ugly, it didn't. Why? Because it turns out you don't make trade policy in a vacuum. And lo and behold, did anybody catch the EU response to this tweet? We can also do stupid. <laughs> now they weren't. They went after ag products. They went after name brand items. They put out a number of painful retaliatory tariffs and everybody said, okay, hold on, let's sit down and talk through this. Now we have an EU trade truce and we're talking about re-engaging in efforts to stimulate more trade, more free trade between the European Union and the United States. Fantastic. Same thing with NAFTA, right? NAFTA was supposed to be a terrible thing. We sat down, we renegotiated. It looks a lot like the old one, but I don't care. The point here is that it looks like we're on a stable path to maintain the relationship with our two most important trading partners in the world, Canada and Mexico. I'm very happy about that. The only thing left, China. And here I give the administration all the credit in the world. Finally, finally, someone said enough is enough. Look, 20 years ago, China signed the WTO agreement. And every day since then, they've gone out of their way to violate every part of the WTO agreement they had just signed. The litany of abuses from currency uh, manipulation to intellectual property right to just flat out fraud and all sorts of things. They don't play fair in the global trade sandbox and they haven't in a long time. Maybe 20 years ago when they were still a desperately poor nation, that was okay. Today they're the biggest economy in the world. It's time to stand up and start playing fair. Enough is enough. Only country that could have stood up to the Chinese and said enough is the United States. Obama should have done it, he didn't do it. Bush should have done it, he didn't do it. Trump did it, and we should be happy. Is it a threat to our economy? Absolutely not, for a couple reasons. First of all, forget exports to China. It's largely irrelevant. Only 7% of our exports go to China, and a lot of that doesn't have very long supply chains. The real issue here is products moving from China to the United States. 20% of all our exports come from China. We are by far and away the biggest buyer of Chinese products. And by the way, that is a, has much longer supply chains. To put this in context, 0.75% of our economy goes there on an annual basis, 4% of their economy comes here. Who's really gonna suffer in the context of a trade war? Us or them? Oh, okay, sure, maybe, maybe there'll be a 25% tariff. But think of this, you go into Macy's, you see a $50 pair of pants that were made in China. What do you think Macy's paid for those pants? Six, seven dollars maybe? Again, not a big issue for us. But for China, this is a threat. This is an economy that's already slowing down. They have issues with an aging workforce. They have issues with corruption. They have issues with all sorts, with real estate and debt. I can go through a litany of things. Their economy is struggling to get ahead. They do not want a trade war with the United States. They are panicked about it. We slapped a 10% tariff on Chinese products. The yuan immediately appreciated by 12%. They picked up the entire tariff for us. If we slap a 25% tariff, I bet your bottom dollar the yuan's gonna depreciate another 15%. They don't care about profits, they care about volume. This is not a short game, it's a long game. And it's a fascinating game, because guess what? A lot of countries are lining up behind us. But as a, for a threat to this expansion, non-existent. Now why would we do this in the first place? Jobs, 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 jobs. Did I mention jobs? <laughs> Every speech. Bobs, jobs, 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 jobs. Whoa, hang on. For a decade, we have been adding 200,000 jobs a month. We have had record levels of employment. Unemployment in the US right now is like 3.8, 3.9%. The job openings rate right now in the United States is 4.7%. There are more job openings than there are people looking for work. More job openings than people looking for work. Think of that. If every person looking for a job got one of these, we'd still have jobs left, openings left over. It's time to start talking about jobs. It's time to start talking about workers. That's what we need. It's a different conversation. And mind you, labor markets are so tight, why aren't people seeing pay raises? Uh, they are. Look, the, the monthly number for the BLS is lousy. It doesn't tell you anything. 
I get numbers from the Atlanta Fed, it's called the Wage Tracker. They look at wage gains for continuously employed full-time workers. Guess what? Over the last five, six years, it's been running on average almost 4%, median about 2%. These are solid numbers. These are better than the last expansion. Well, it's good to see because the workers in America have a lot of catching up to do. Now, you're going to see this statistic bandied about a lot for the next couple of years, and I just love this. This is real median income for male workers in the U.S. economy. You can download this from the Census Bureau. That must mean it's true. <laughs> and it says something very important. In 2017, your median male worker made $40,000 a year. In 1973, in inflation-adjusted terms, they made $40,000 a year. Sounds pretty scary. Wow. No increase in incomes in 40 years. Stop. Now, mind you, I was six years old in 1973, OK? So I don't remember really clearly, but I've seen pictures. It didn't look that fun, OK? <laughs> I can't believe that this is becoming a center point of conversation about the health of the US economy. Is this credible? This is a nonsensical statistic at every level. I cannot believe anybody would say this out loud as if it's true. Let, let me give you a couple examples. In 1973, your median male worker lived a little less than 68 years. Today, it's 76. Infant mortality was 1.8. Now it's 0.6. Crime rate, 4% down to 2.8%. Uh, violent crime rate down even more. The percent of the population with college degree or higher went from 13% to almost 35%. We live longer, we live healthier, we live safer, we live more educated. Where's that in the data? And of course the answer is it's not. Look, inflation is a metric that tries to measure the price of a basket of purchased goods from year to year. In no way, shape, or form can that be used to measure quality of life. We've never had things so good. I mean, here's a couple other ways of thinking about it. Something as basic as your smartphone. Who has a smartphone in this room? Everybody, you don't raise your hand. <laughs> Everybody. 85% of Americans have smart, 85% of Americans have smartphones. By the way, my buddy just got back from Bangladesh. He was doing charity in the countryside of Bangladesh, one of the poorest places on the planet. And guess what they have in the countryside of Bangladesh? Smartphones. Now you might say, so what? What do you mean, so what? You got this thing in your hand. You can communicate with anybody in the world for free. You have infinite access to entertainment, information, knowledge, politics, communication, right there in the palm of your hands. You can get health advice, crop advice. Where is that in the data? Now, by the way, what's a, what did a cell phone look like in 1973? Let me demonstrate. <laughs> Not quite the same, you know what I mean? Same thing with cars. And that basic entry-level car that anybody afford, a, a little Hyundai with Bluetooth and airbags, and it goes 50,000 miles before you have to change the brakes, and it gets 40 miles a gallon. Here's an entry-level car in 1973. <laughs> Ugly at any speed, folks, all right? <laughs> a TV today, a TV in 1973. Online shopping today, online shopping in 1973, right? <laughs> Encyclopedia today, who remembers Funk and Wagnall back in 1973? I mean, it's amazing to me that we have sucked into this bizarre myth that things haven't improved since 1973. That's insane. Was there anything better in the 1970s? John Travolta was better in the 1970s, all right? <laughs> Everything else was worse. It's crazy. Well, what about inequality? Look, inequality isn't as bad as, as you think it is either, because the numbers are flawed. It doesn't look at taxes paid or benefits received. Once you account for that, inequality hasn't risen in a decade. Now, it isn't to say we have too much or too little inequality, but if we're going to have the debate, can we start with the right data? By the way, if you want to talk about inequality, forget income inequality. Wealth inequality is what you be petrified about. 1% of Americans own 40% of all wealth. And that doesn't, that's the stuff we know of. We're not talking about the stuff shoved away in accounts in Panama or the Cayman Islands or anything else. That's terrifying. It's destabilizing. And by the way, a $15 an hour minimum wage will never fix this. So can we talk about the right things? Here's a real issue. Labor force growth, lack thereof, 1%. In fact, the participation rates are rising. Why? Demographics, not economics. Boomers are retiring. And that is an enormous event for the US economy at so many levels. You know, it's so critical to understand. Boomers 
Obviously, this huge generation that turned around and had very few kids. The net result is our population pyramid has turned into a population column. You hear all the time, millennials are the biggest generation ever. Yeah, they're 3% bigger than the boomers. And now the boomers are retiring, we're not bringing people back into labor force. You think it's bad? Imagine how bad it would be about those red bars. Those are people born overseas. You know, you look at the support ratio, how that's about to collapse, how Medicare spending is going to go through the roof. This is why a couple of years ago, the Congressional Budget Office put out a little guidepost, how do you make the US economy grow faster? And it's amazing, because they put this out, and we've done everything wrong. They said, for example, enact immigration reform to increase the number of workers. Quite the opposite, we're trying to throw people out of this country, and we're making H-1B visas nigh on to impossible to get. Reform the income tax code. No, we'll have fiscal stimulus. Increase the Social Security retirement age. Actually, right now, Democrats in Congress are talking about expanding Social Security benefits. Boom! What are you thinking? Reduce deficits by $4 trillion. The tax plan in late 2017 increased it by $4 trillion. I mean, everything the CBO told us to do, and they're doing everything else, to, it's amazing to me that we're not having one right conversation. And by the way, again, that's both sides of the aisle. So if things are so good in the short run, why are the markets acting crazy? Well, keep in mind, six months ago, we were worried about prices being overpriced. Now we're kind of back to normal. You held on to stocks over the last decade, you're still up 12.2% per year. More importantly, the fundamentals of the stock market are great. Corporate profits actually have been growing over the last year. Net corporate profits because the tax cuts are growing faster. Actually, stocks right now looks like a great investment. Of course, why do they sell off? Well, I don't know. This is the sixth time it's happened since the Great Recession came to an end. Six times. Six times we have a double digit sell off. In a typical expansion, you'll see one. Six. Why? High speed trading. You know, we used to have traders who cared about economics in 10Ks. Now trading is done by computer programmers who wouldn't know an economic statistic if it bit them on the butt. We've turned our stock market into a video game. Not healthy, and no one's talking about it. What set it off this time? Probably higher interest rates. Why would that get anybody worried? I don't know. The economy is growing great. There's more federal borrowing. Interest rates should have drifted up. There's no surprise there. But of course, everybody thought it was inflation. No side of inflation. There was never going to be inflation. We had 2% a couple of months last year, and it's already cooled off. Of course it is. M2 growth, money supply growth, is a paltry 4%. In a vacuum, I'd be way more worried about deflation. Then why is the Fed tightening? Here's the scariest answer I can tell you. I have no idea. <laughs> There's no reason for them to do what they were doing. Thankfully, it looks like they've stopped. Good news. Now, what about different parts of the nation? After all, we know some places are doing great and some are doing horrible. This is unemployment rate by state, color-coded. Ah, little quiz. I didn't give you the code. <laughs> so what's a higher unemployment rate, a lighter or darker color? What do you think? What, what is that? Darker. You're right. Darker is higher unemployment rates. The lowest unemployment rate in the nation right now is in Iowa. Yes. Iowa has the lowest unemployment rate. Why? Because no one wants to live in Iowa. <clears throat> and they're moving. You laugh, but look at the pace. Look where people are moving. They're moving out of the Midwest. They're moving to the Northeast. They're going to Oregon, Idaho, Washington, Nevada, Arizona, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina. They are moving out of those areas to these areas, with one exception, California. People are moving out of California. What is going on? Well, again. Not this. Oh, we hear about all the bad things about California all the time. And a lot of that stems from the fact that California is typically overexposed to downturns in our economy. When things have gone bad, the last three recessions, they've been much worse here because of our exposure to it. But between that point in time, California continues to grow at an excessive pace. Look at the numbers. In the last five years, California is tied for the fastest pace of economic output growth. We're eighth fastest in terms of job growth, 2.6% per year. One out of six jobs created in the US created here in the state of California. And by the way, that's top 10. Does anybody see Texas? Hmm. All right? California's share of national personal income never been higher. California's share of US GDP never been higher. Our economy is pushing the US economy forward. We're not holding the back. This place is doing great. Well, that all sounds well and good, but you know, it's just the Bay Area. I love this. This was a comment uh, when last year, 
uh, our, you, the California became the fifth largest economy in the world. And there's a radio interview with Joel Cochran, who's a kind of a grand old soul in, in the urban planning biz, if you will. He's out of Chapman University. But, but Joel has hit an important point in his career. You know, we all get there. That point in your career where you no longer need facts to have opinions. Come on, you, you, know, how, you know what I'm talking about, right? Every person's parent got to that point in their life at some point, right? So what does he say about our great economy? Almost all income growth and high-end job growth took place in Silicon Valley. Rest of the state, total hellhole. Really? Again, look, the Bay Area punches above its weight. I get that. You know, we had 550,000 100K plus jobs from 14 to 17. 200,000 of those were in the Bay Area. That's a lot. A lot of really high-income people there. By the way, 200,000 were in Southern California. 150,000 were every place else. It wasn't just the Bay Area. In fact, it's amazing. As much attention as the Bay Area gets, it actually isn't that big of a part of the growth of the, of the California economy. Another little quiz here. Um, on the left-hand side is growth rate in jobs between 1995 and 2015. On the right is five different parts of the state. This is a matching game where you have to match the letter to the number. I'll let you focus on that for a couple seconds, and then I'll give you the answer key, OK? So match, you know, got to find your letters, talk around your table. All right, you ready? Here's the answer key. Those are perfectly lined up. In fact, if you think about it, if, if you want to look over the last 20 years, 40% of all new employed residents in California live in th three counties, LA, Riverside, and San Bernardino. Kern County by itself added as many full-time workers as San Jose has over the last 20 years. The Bay Area is big from a name and income perspective, and they always get to pick the governor. But They're not big from an overall growth perspective. They're relatively irrelevant. It's Southern California where things are happening, and incomes are rising everywhere. Here in Kern County, now Kern County is an interesting place. You know, you guys kind of zig when everybody else is zagging. And a lot of that has to do with oil, and a lot of that has to do with agriculture. The drivers here, a lot of times California's booming, you guys have been slowing down. When we had the Great Recession, the rest of the state was tanking, you guys are doing pretty good. So a little zig and zag going on, but nevertheless, the signs are good. Household incomes are growing, not quite as fast for the state, but things are actually going on the rise here. But of course, over the last few years, things have been tough because of oil. But you're starting to see a new wind, a new momentum in this economy. And you can see some of the numbers here, how things are starting to kick up and move forward again. And you can sure see it in the numbers. You know, we just got the January 19 employment data, and it's important because you get the revised data. The end of the year data in 2018 is a little, a little scary. We just got the 19 data, which you can believe. And guess what? The numbers are great. 3% job growth in Kern County, one of the fastest growing economies. Finally, after years of very little happening, growth has really taken off. What's pushing it? Farm employment has grown a lot. Healthcare employment, as, oh, as many places, is growing. Professionals up. Construction and logistics on fire. A lot of good things starting to happen in this particular county. Good, solid numbers. <coughs> you can see establishments kicking up as well. <coughs> Excuse me. That's establishments on the left-hand side. You can see a breakdown in all the different growth of these different things. Healthcare, again, in particular, near the top. Logistics, uh, uh, construction, hospitality. Think of hotels and restaurants. A lot of good numbers there. Consumer spending is starting to pick up there. A very good year for taxable sales in 2018, pushing things forward. Again, a broad selection of stuff, particularly business and industry, pushing things up quite a bit as well. Farm employment has been flat for the last few years, but it's not because agriculture hasn't been doing well. In fact, that's real output in the agricultural sector on the right-hand side there. We don't have the 2018 data. 2016 was a banner year. A little bit of a 2017 slowdown in terms of output, but it's still the second highest on record. Ag's doing great. And of course, some of the biggest crops, grapes, almonds, and citrus. That's the place you want to be, right? That's the really valuable stuff around there. Again, doing really good. Uh, hang on, I'm having a problem with the remote control here. Ah, mining and oil. Obviously, this has been a big hit to the local economy because of prices. You're seeing oil output drop here at this particular point in time. This is a hit, and Canada, I don't think it's going to bounce back anytime in the near future for the reason I already told you. $50 a barrel, it's hard for Kern County to compete. That's OK. Economies ebb and flow. The important thing is everything else that's happening and how good that is. Um, here's extraction values. You can see, again, how, how low that's become over the last couple of years. But take a look at defense contract. Take a look at Department of Defense employment. 
all-time high here in the county. You look out at the eastern part of the county, you look at the southern part of the county, you think about aerospace and defense, booming parts of the local economy. Again, giving a big lift to the overall region. Labor force is starting to grow. Unemployment, after being flat for a couple of years, is dropped down below 8% in the county. Good numbers across the board, very, very solid things. And of course, you see it in commercial real estate and commercial real estate permits. Take a look at non-residential permits. I actually sent my guys back and go, I think you have a problem in the data. They're like, no, that's real. That's a giant surge. Because all of a sudden, there's all sorts of new construction being slated, whether it's retail, commercial, hotel, office, good numbers across the board. People are putting money back into Kern County. And that's happening for a reason. And it's something for you to be looking forward to. This is interesting. While Kern County is starting to pick up, the rest of the state is starting to slow down. In fact, over the last year or so, take a look at the fastest growing economies out there. San Jose is still near the top, and then you have Stockton, Santa Rosa, the Inland Empire, and Fresno. What's going on? Why the slowdown? Well, it's not because of a weak economy. Yet again, it goes back to the basic issue of labor force availability. The unemployment rate in California has never been lower than it is right now. It's never been lower in the Inland Empire. It's never been lower in Los Angeles. It's never been lower in Fresno. We're running out of workers. And by the way, typically, when we have a hot economy and there's lots of jobs, people move to California, because guess what? It's a lot nicer than Iowa. Now, I know, if you're from Iowa, don't be offended. I'm from Western New York. It's a hell of a lot nicer than Western New York, too, OK? Why aren't people moving here? Well, that's a housing conversation. We don't build housing. And it really is a, boils down to that. We don't build enough housing. As a result of that, prices have been going up and going up and going up. We've put a big sign out there that said, you must be this rich to move to the state of California. And you certainly see it in terms of those prices. Now, we talk about this as being an affordability problem. It is not an affordability problem. Affordability problem is this. We have lots of empty apartment and homes. We just, people can't afford it. No. We don't have lots of empty homes. We don't have lots of empty apartments. In fact, every basic measure of the housing market here in California suggests we are at record low vacancy rates. We have overcrowding problems. We have homeless problems. We don't have an excess supply of units. The reason affordability is bad is because we don't build enough. How bad is that? We did some simulations. This state, to maintain 2% job growth, needs 200 to 250,000 permits a year. We're building 130%. I'm sorry, 130,000. Half, half of what we need. And that doesn't include the fact that we have a giant backlog, probably a couple million units. This is a supply problem, not an affordability problem. Why is that critical? I'll tell you why. If you tack affordability, you hurt supply. Rent control hurts supply. Inclusionary housing hurts supply. Uh, uh, special taxes to subsidize other housing hurts supply. So you help affordability, you hurt supply, which hurts affordability, you're chasing your tail. If you attack supply, that helps affordability. The best thing you can do to help the affordability problem is make sure you build a heck of a lot more units. And that means a giant change in the approach of how we build housing in this state. Gavin Newsom, in fact, this entire gubernatorial election, for the first time, actually acknowledged that. There was the actual acknowledgment that this is a supply problem. And they have big numbers. Oh, I'm going to build the half a million units. I'm going to build a million units. I'm going to build one and a half million units. I don't know how they're going to build that many units, but at least they're talking about it. And of course, prices are starting to drift up. You can see the Inland Empire is way out ahead. Here in Bakersfield, of course, over 200,000. Uh, up in, in the Inland Empire, over 350,000. Rents are going up as well. And that's interesting, because I want you to think a little bit about Southern California. Take LA and Orange County, which has slowed down tremendously. They were at the bottom of the list. Well, that's, on the left-hand side, that's labor force in, the, in, the, in basically the Inland Empire, LA, and Orange County. LA and Orange County have, over the course of the last 15 years, added about 2 thirds of a percent to their labor force because of the constraints placed on housing production. 2 thirds of a percent per year. So how does LA and Orange County expect, if you will, to continue to maintain 2% job growth? And the answer has been, how many cars can I get on the 10, the 60, the 55, and the 91? Well, guess what? The Inland Empire, which has seen a lot of labor force growth, has not built a lot of housing lately. 
And in fact, the unemployment rate in Inland Empire is now lower than it is in LA County. It is lower than LA County. There is no longer an excess supply of housing and workers in the Inland Empire for LA and Orange County to draw on. And the entire Southern California economy is starting to grind to a halt. And that, of course, brings me to this graph, which is probably one of the most important graphs I can show you. This is housing permits in the Inland Empire, just south of you here. Look where that isn't. You know, back in 2004 and 5, 13,000 permits per quarter. Right now, not even 4,000. Not even a third of what was being built back there. Guess what? Because the resistance, the resistance to housing that has been such an ongoing feature of Orange County and LA over the past two decades is now firmly entrenched in the Inland Empire as well. They're not building the housing. Suddenly, the entire massive region is starting to slow down because of a lack of workers. Of course, anybody who's going to invest in Southern California has to think about, well, where do I go now? And the answer is Kern County. So good things happening. And of course, you got a little catching up to do. Because of the bad economy in the last couple of years, people have been leaving. But in 2017 and 18, that's turned in positive. Populations are starting to grow again. Permits are starting to tick up. But I would tell you right now, this is only the beginning. Because the lack of housing south of you is going to create a new urge for more economic development in some of those sectors that had previously kind of located it more in the Inland Empire. Talk about logistics. This is just the beginning. You can think about light manufacturing. Just beginning. All built on top of the things that are already here, including a very successful ag sector and aerospace and defense. So it's a very exciting time for Kern County. There's no doubt about it. There are a lot of very good things coming down the pike at you. And of course, overall, the US economy is doing pretty good too, which is good news for the Kern County. Look, overall, GDP growth is going to be 2% plus this year. Labor markets are going to remain tight. Wages are going to put pressure on profits. However, experts in business investment will be very strong. Inflation is going to constrain. Interest rates are low. Lending is too constrained, but the commercial markets remain steady. That levels are safe. California, even with a lack of labor force, is still an economic star. A lot of good things happening. As for the negatives, labor shortages, housing shortages, will the Fed start to tighten again? Equity markets are behaving oddly, the deficit is widening, bank lending constraint, political uncertainty dominating headlines, critical long run policy issues remaining completely undiscussed. But the thing that worries me the most, miserabilism. This bizarre world where we run around pretending how bad things are when we've never had it so good. Our inability to appreciate how wonderful things are and to tackle real problems in a responsible way. It's scary to me how absolutely out of touch the conversation in Washington, D.C. is. And it's only getting worse. It's only getting worse. Whatever your party affiliation is, whether you were upset or happy that the Democrats took over Congress, here's what I saw happen this last election. We have fewer centrists now than we did a year ago. That's going the wrong way. You know, the great disconnect. What we worry about, what we should worry about. We worry about jobs. We should worry about workers. We worry about who pays for health care, the big fights over Obamacare. We should worry about what we're paying for and why we pay so much more than any developed nation. We worry about tax levels. We should worry about tax structures. Income inequality, wealth inequality. Funded government liabilities, no, it's the unfunded government liabilities. Business investment, no, it's a lack of public investment. Inflation, no, slowing bank lending. And of course, the cost of California housing, no. It's the supply of California housing. Look, I've been a professor for a bunch of years, and I can tell you something very straightforward. If you don't ask the right question, you're never going to get the right answer. And we're asking all the wrong questions. We're worried about the wrong things. And in many ways, this is a political calculation. Because the problems we do have, economically, are simple to fix. But politically, they're a little scary. Well, I'm sorry. This is a point in time with the wealth and the prosperity our nation is currently enjoying, this is the time to have real conversations about real questions. It's time to stop demonizing the other side of the aisle and yet again go back to this thing called compromise, which, by the way, is the root of politics. You know, I will say this. If you don't compromise, you shouldn't be a politician. Politician is the art of compromise. So everybody needs to stop this insane attacking rhetoric, what I want you to do is to turn off the weapons of mass distraction, 
Take a step back from the ledge. Think about how good things are and tell our elected leaders enough is enough. Sit down on the table, talk about the right things, and fix the real problems. Because you know what? There's no reason in the world that this expansion has to do anything but continue for a long time, as long as we make the right decisions. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day.